I'd like to start off with a couple of announcements. The first one comes from the uh, uh, Lambeth, the Lambeth House, the official residence of the Archbishop of Canterbury. And uh, the announcement is that the Archbishop will not be attending this year any of the celebrations which are being held to commemorate the Peasants' Revolt. He won't be going to Canterbury where a lot of respectable people have arranged uh, a commemoration of the Peasants' Revolt. He won't be going there. He won't be going to Blackheath where there's another celebration on June the 16th. He won't be going to Mile End where there's another celebration on June the 17th. He won't be going, certainly won't be going to Westminster Abbey where I understand some people are trying to have a celebration there. He won't be going anywhere. And it's not because he's busy because a spokesman for the Archbishop was quoted a fortnight ago as saying this is not a celebration with which Dr. Ron Runcy would want to be associated. And that's not altogether surprising <laughs> because um, as you will have seen in the program to this rally the first thing that the rebels did when they got into the Tower of London on June the 16th, 1381, was to search out the Archbishop of Canterbury, to tell him what they thought of him, and to chop off his head. <laughs> now the second announcement comes from Buckingham Palace. <laughs> and that is that Her Majesty the Queen will not be attending any celebrations this year to commemorate the Peasants' Revolt. And that is rather surprising, really, because if there's one thing that you can explain the immediate failure of the Peasants' Revolt, when it did fail, it is that the people had faith in their monarch. I think it's a bit churlish of Her Majesty uh, not to commemorate that fact, but perhaps she feels that people won't make the same mistake again. <laughs> now, we will be there, I hope, most of us, not in all those places at once, but in a whole lot of other places where there are to be these celebrations this June, and I thought it was worth remembering why. And to do that, we've got to go back a long way. We've got to go back what seems an unconscionable time, 600 years. We've got to go back to an England where there were only two and a half million people living, and all of them, or almost all of the people in it, bound in one way or another to the land they were working and to the Lord who owned that land. The serf worked the land and the Lord worked the serf. That's the explanation of the feudal system in a single sentence. That's how it operated. And everything except the right to buy and sell the actual people, which was something that had happened under the Roman Empire and something that would happen again in Africa and America, except for the right to buy and sell the actual people, everything that the serf did or the villain did in terms of the things that they produced on the land, in terms even of the bodies of the children that they, uh, that, that they had, the bodies even of their children were the property of the Lord, everything. And the relationship between the Lord and the people who produced their wealth was like the relationship between the Lord and the beast of burden, except that probably the beast of burden was more generously treated. That was a rough picture. And the feudal system which is described so often, as though it was something of the natural order, as something that was tidy and well parceled up, but was in fact an utterly brutal and utterly horrible system, was at the time that we're discussing beginning to crack up completely to crack, up more perhaps to fray at the edges. People were coming with money, people coming and understood that you didn't just have to produce one for one in each manner, in each uh, section, but you could produce a lot of things cheaper and sell them across the board and make more money that way. And money coming into the system, buying and selling coming into the system, meant that people also found that they could, if they really worked hard, produce a little bit of surplus even on top of that that they were giving to their Lord, even on top of that that was given to the church. 
because it wasn't just the Lord that took the surplus that was made, the church also took its tenth. The church and the archbishop had found a quotation from Genesis of the story of Jacob's ladder, I'm sure you all remember it. Of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. And they'd rewritten it to saying, Of all that thou shalt make, thou shalt surely give a tenth to me. And so they saw it, and that was what the tithe barns were built for, and that was what the tithe meant, that a tenth of what you made on top of everything that you gave to the Lord uh, went to the church. Uh, and if you died, it was extremely expensive. The, uh, uh, the Lord took, that is if you died under the age of 60, the Lord took your best beast to compensate for the amount of military service that you would have given if only you'd lived to 60. And the church then took your second best beast to compensate for the tithes that you would, have, you, would have, you would have paid if only you'd have the decency to live to the proper age. And since no families at all had more than two beasts, you can see the poverty that all that kind of system operated. It was beginning to crack up. There was the money beginning to come in and the ordinary processes of economic advancement beginning to break up that system. That was the situation that existed then. The beginning of the breakups were hardly felt at all by the people at the bottom of society. Only tiny particles of freedom coming to them. And at the top of the society at this time, even, it wasn't making any real substantial difference that the previous rulers of England had been the king, the landed gentry, the barons, and the clergy, the three. And now there was, by way of a change, the king, the landed gentry, and the barons, the clergy, and the monopolists. That was the difference that was being made by the crack up, uh, by the beginning of the crack up of the feudal system. Now, who were the rulers of England at this time? What sort of people were in charge? Most of the time up to the Peasant Revolt, although not actually during it, there was a fine old tyrant called Edward III, usually described in most uh, school history books as a good king. Always be <laughs> suspicious when that, is, uh, when that is written about. The thing that Edward liked to do most of all was to uh, go to war. That was because he didn't have to do any of the fighting and because it was the quickest way to make booty. He couldn't get it out of the barons very easily, couldn't get it out of the monopolists very easily, but he found that if he could win, or somebody else could win, a battle in France, like Crecy or Poitiers, then that was a quick way of making booty, and so he was always off to war. In fact, he was uh, one of the inspirers of what's known as the Hundred Years' War. The best thing for him was to be at war for a hundred years. And one of the things he did in the process of this was that he, which is interesting to this story, insisted that the people should be armed, or at any rate, instructed in the processes of arms. And he was very adamant that there shouldn't be any pastimes undertaken by anyone at all, uh, which should take away from time, which would otherwise be given to archery practice. There's a statute in 1341, which decrees that anyone caught playing football, handball, hockey, or racing dogs was liable to imprisonment. Now the king had a gang, and they were known as a gang, and uh, <coughs> central to the gang was his brother John of Gaunt. Any Shakespeare readers here, I'm a great Shakespeare supporter by the way, but he really was wrong about John of Gaunt. If you read uh, uh, in Shakespeare about John of Gaunt, he appears to be a benevolent old man usually dying. Now, <coughs> at this time he was very much not dying, he was another man who loved to fight wars. He had an obsession. Most of these people have a psychological disorder of one kind. <laughs> His was that he wanted to become the King of Castile. At the time he declared the King of Castile, he didn't see why there should be a King of Castile that wasn't him. And it really <laughs> drove him to all kinds of relentless persecutions of people in order to go and fight in Castile. He couldn't fight in Castile. He would take time off fighting the Scots. <laughs> he laid claim to, the, uh, to being the most hated man in England. It was much contested among the gang <laughs> as to who was the most hated man in England. But I think John of Gaunt probably quite rightly did lay claim to that. Uh, he, he, he represented in this gang, of course, uh, the old landed gentry, and so did Sir Robert Hales, who was very, very close behind him uh, for the most hated man. 
he was the treasurer, what's known today I think as the Chancellor of the Exchequer, and he was widely known even by his friends, in fact I think he probably thought of it himself, as Hob the Robber. Uh, Simon of Sudbury, Archbishop of Canterbury, Lord Chancellor, just in case there should be any doubt that the church laid down the laws, he made certain that he was head of the church and head of the law at the same time, just in case there should be any confusion on that matter. And the fifth member of the gang, the monopolist who joins them, a man called Richard Lyons, uh, he had discovered, mathematics was very uh, in vogue at that time, and he had discovered this, that if he paid for the king's war, though you want to go to war, right, here's some money, uh, go to war, uh, that if he could get the monopoly over the buying and selling of wool, that there would be a big profit in it. I mean, I'll explain it to you because these things are complicated. He bought the wool for six pounds by order of the king, and he sold it for 14 pounds, you see, by order of the king, and therefore made a profit. Complicated, it's a thing which was only available to a few people in society to understand that sort of subtlety, but he made himself extremely rich by the process and became an expert uh, in housing, uh, particularly as he had seven very lovely ones of his own. Now this this was the gang that ruled England. They were known as the gang, uh, representing these different powers. And of course, as different powers do, rep do from time to time, they were constantly, during the period, 30 or 40 years running up to the revolt, quarrelling with one another, arguing as to who was to pay for the, for, for, the, for the wars, who was to pay for this, who was to pay for that, where were the taxes going to come from, who was to collect the taxes, all the time the arguments going on between the king the clergy, the barons, and the monopolists, represented as each of them were by a gang that controlled the country. But of course, each of them, as they were arguing, and as the wars went badly, the arguments got fiercer, so as the arguments got fiercer, the single point on which they could unite also became more solid, namely their hatred and contempt for all the people who produced the wealth over which they were quarrelling. Now then, in 1348, there came a thing which increased that hatred and contempt beyond anything that anyone had ever imagined possible up to that time. The Black Death, a great bubonic plague coming up from Europe and sweeping through the country, killing people at a rate it's almost impossible to imagine. Perhaps 15% of the population killed outright within a few days and in great pain as a result of this uh, plague. 300,000 people, that is, out of about 2 million, killed in that time. And of course the numbers killed among the serfage and the villainage among the people at the bottom of society were far, far greater in proportion than those at the top. And the immediate effect of this, however, was not just the misery attached to all that death, but the immediate economic effect was a rather different one, which was that as there were less serfs, and less villains about the place to do more work as a result of the plague. So for the first time, for a very, very long time, for the first time since the Norman Conquest, the people at the bottom of society began to feel a growing confidence about their economic condition in society. They began to feel that they were in demand instead of the demand all the time being made of them, they could make demands of someone else because they were scarce. Their labor was scarce, and their labor was vital to the society, and out of the scarcity they could make some advancement. And just as soon as they did start to make some advancement, just as soon as they did start to press for higher wages if they were wage earners, or for more freedom if they were serfs or villains, so the government started to move in repression against them. And you have passed in 1351 the first known occasion of statutory incomes policy in Britain. People think that that's a modern thing, not at all. The statute of labourers, I expect you're taught that at school, you remember it. No one told you that it was an incomes policy. And if there's any doubt about it, I'll read it out to you. Because I think it uh, formed the perfect precursor, if you like, to all the people who have recently been conducting incomes policies, all the Barbara Castles and Ted Heaths and Jack Jones and Hugh Scanlon, listen to this. Because a great part of the people, and especially of workmen and servants, late died of the pestilence, 
many seeing the necessity of masters and the great scarcity of servants, will not serve unless they may receive excessive wages and some willing to beg in idleness than by labour to get their living. We, considering the grievous incommodities which of the lack especially of ploughmen and such labourers as may hereafter come, have upon deliberation and treaty of the prelates and the nobles and learned men assisting us ordained. 1. Every able-bodied person under 60 shall be bound to serve when required at no higher wage than in the 20th year of the reign or else be committed to prison. There's a good way of doing it. You don't have to muck around with guidelines and all that sort of thing. <laughs> what you say is, you've got to work and you've got to work for what you had 10 years ago. And if you don't do that, you'll go to prison. Now that was passed, and of course the people who passed it, the gang and their council, when you pass laws in, in the past, that was the end of the matter. But here was a rather different circumstance arising which had never happened before. They passed a law which was promptly broken, and broken, and broken. And not only broken by the people underneath, but also broken to their horror by some of the employers who found that they would rather produce things than not produce things, and would rather pay the wages to wandering workers uh, than obey the statute of labourers. And so, for 30 years following that statute, from 1351 to 1381, you have a period of relentless class war, real class battle going on between the people at the top trying to hold on to their property in conditions which seem to be running against them, passing law after law in order to try to keep themselves in control and their property at the level to which they were accustomed. 1360, punishment of labourers who depart from their service to another town or county. If he cannot be found, he is to be outlawed and a writ issued to every sheriff in England to take and bring him back to the county where the writ was issued and there to have the letter F for falsity branded on his forehead. 1361, the sheriff shall have power to restrain all evildoers, rioters and barators, whoever they are, and to pursue, arrest, take and chastise them according to their trespass. It's awfully old language, isn't it? Sounds awfully long time ago, that 1361 statute, that particular one. Uh, Harry McShane, if he's here, will remember that in um, <laughs> December 1932, Tom Mann, the communist agitator and unemployed workers' organiser, was arrested under the statute of 1361 and held for three days without charge under this statute while the unemployed demonstration that he'd organised took place. And before they passed this Criminal Trespass Act into Parliament the other day, this statute, 1361, in these conditions, was the one that they used to, pro uh, to procure uh, criminal charges against people who were in engaged in trespass. 1363, petition in Parliament to prevent women wearing clothes that ought to belong to a higher rank. In 1377, King Edward died and replaced by his uh, grandson, Richard, who was only ten years old. But the statutes went on. 1378, no bondswoman may put her children to school. Why should she put her children to school when he could well be put to work? 1379, this is one I like particularly, for punishment of devisers of false news and reporters of horrible and false lies <laughs> concerning prelates, dukes, earls and barons and other nobles and great men of the realm <laughs> whereof great peril and mischief might come to all the realm and quick subversion and destruction of the said realm if due remedy be not provided due remedy was of course provided brandings and burnings and imprisonments, and this last one was directed as a matter of fact, not to the investigative reporters of that time, or there were none, but against the people who carried the word uh, in a different way to the way in which it's carried now, who carried it by word of mouth to meeting places in village after village. And these were religious people working within the framework of the religion, but attacking the way in which the religion was being carried out. Excommunicated monks and priests 
who for the first time that anybody could ever remember were beginning to challenge the power and control of the church over people's minds. How people thought, if they thought at all, if they had a moment to think, was dictated by what God said through the Archbishop of Canterbury. And John Wycliffe started off the process. He wasn't a wandering priest at all, he was the master of Balliol. But he started off the process in which he said, for instance, that there could be such a thing, there could be such a thing as a corrupt priest. Unheard of, unimaginable that there should be such a thing said. But he said it. And he also said that if there is a corrupt priest, that priest should not be obeyed. And out of that tradition of challenging the church, the wandering preachers, excommunicated and imprisoned and constantly harassed by these statutes, started to take false rumours about prelates and earls into the villages uh, and speak to them uh, at these meetings from 1860 to, uh, so 1360 to 1381, for those 20 years before the revolt, these people moved around and brought these simple messages. The most famous of them, the one we know most about, is John Ball who was the parish priest at Colchester, St. James's Church in Colchester, if anywhere, one from Colchester here, who was, of course, excommunicated for talking this kind of talk and took to the walking around the villages and talking. And he came to the argument, directed himself to the argument, whereby the church justified the nature of human society as it was at that time. There was human society divided between the possessed and the dispossess. What was the justification for that? People seemed to have the same physical characteristics. They seemed to be the same. What was the justification for this fantastic division? And of course, the church applied themselves to that as they do very carefully, and they came up with the answer. Read the Bible, it's there, they said. Adam and Eve had three sons. They were called Cain and Abel and Seth. And Cain did a terrible thing. A thing unimaginably horrible. He killed his brother. Of course, these people were killing their brothers all through the centuries. But that, in terms of Cain and Abel, that was a terrible thing that Cain did. And Cain, therefore, represented the evil, the barbarous, the people who are ineducable, the people that lived at the bottom of society, the people, if you come and live at the bottom of society, you're descended from Cain. That explains it. You're descended from Cain. Sorry, that's why you're there. <laughs> Then there were the people descended from Seth, who was quite a different character altogether. Very respectable gentleman, never short of his brother in public anyway. <laughs> and even, uh, you know, eventually begat Noah. You know, Noah, I mean, this absolute pinnacle of respectability and behaved with great uh, foresight and vision. When there was a natural disaster, he packed his ark with all the important people, namely his own family, and uh, all the important animals. He was the precursor of the people who are arranging the nuclear shelters today. <laughs> Noah and the ark, chief executives, and all the people packing the nuclear. There they were, people with great foresight and vision, and therefore if you were descended from Seth, very few people descended from Seth, but if you were descended from Seth, then really you were civilized people, educated people, people on top of the society, and that biblically explained the condition and the circumstance of the human race. And John Ball came to it directly and wiped it clean with a wonderful rhyming couplet which was at the top of all his speeches and the top of all the propaganda. And remember, it's not just one John Ball, there's hundreds of them all through this period. When Adam delved and Eve span, who was then the gentleman? It means two things really, doesn't it? It means on the one hand, in the beginning, in the beginning when people first existed, when the, there were first human beings able to use their brain power to conquer the animal kingdom and to conquer nature, then first, where was it? To, where could you say that one person was more important than the other? Where could you see the class origin? That also means something else, by the way, very much, by the way. It means, in those circumstances, where was the evidence that the man was superior to the woman? <laughs> Where's the origin of the class? Where is the origin? Where, where does it come from? If you take the Bible, if you take Adam and Eve and the children that they had, we'll take it from the beginning and let's find the argument. 
We don't have the speeches, unfortunately. There were no scribes really taking down speeches in shorthand from what John Ball and all the other preachers were saying at that time. Occasionally, somebody in a monastery will find a chronicler. And here's one little thing from one of the John Ball speeches which shows the inspiration and the ideal which he held up to people. My good friends, matters cannot go well in England, nor ever will, until all things shall be held in common when there shall be neither vassals nor lords, when the lords shall be no more masters than ourselves. Simple, elementary equality preached there within the framework of religion. And not just the idea of equality preached, not just the inspiration of the idea, but most importantly and central to this entire story, the organization that went with the idea. The organization that the idea could be put into effect if people took some kind of activity. And what you have there is not just people wandering around with vague ideas and sermons around the villages saying nice things to people about how all things will be held in common. You have 30 years proved there, really again and again, proved particularly when we come to the revolt itself, 30 years of agitation, 30 years of organization, of inspiration to action, of appointment of representatives, of linking the experience between town and country. All these things were going on at that time. And just as they were going on, so the authorities came again and again to try and suppress it. In a single year, 1379, in 4500s, which is not a very big area, around and about the areas of Essex, 10,000 pounds were taken in fines on the peasantry in a single year. Now you may say that doesn't sound a great, not, great, not, not very much now, in fact it sounds quite a lot, even nowadays uh, that that amount should be taken in fines. But when I tell you that the average monthly wage paid to ploughmen and reapers at that time was one shilling, that is a twentieth of a pound, was the average monthly wage, then you'll see the extent to which the courts and the lawyers were attempting to enforce these statutes which they passed. The enormous quantities of people in prison, the large numbers of brandings, and the tremendous amount of money taken in fines, all these are indications of what was going on. But all to no avail. There was a man called John Gower. He was a, uh, he was a, a, a landlord and a lawyer, needless to say. You really had to be one in order to be the other. And he wrote shortly before the Peasants' Revolt broke out, the prejudices of the class that he represented in the most extraordinary prophecy, only about six months before the revolt broke out. Three things, all of the same sort, are merciless when they get the upper hand. A water flood, a wasting fire, and the common multitude of small folk. For these will never be checked by reason or discipline, and therefore, to speak in brief, the present world is so troubled by them that it is well to set a remedy up thereunto. Ha! Age of ours, whither turnest thou? For the poor and small folk who should cleave to their labor demand to be better fed than their masters. Moreover, they bedeck themselves in fine colors and fine attire, whereas were it not for their pride and their privy conspiracies, they could be clad in sackcloth as of old. That was the attitude of the class then, exactly mirroring how they felt, exactly showing how worried they were about the rise in the standard of living in spite of all that repression, of all those law courts, of all the religious preaching in the churches, the villains and the serfs and the wage, uh, and the wage earners were beginning to make further inroads upon the wealth of the rulers. And the rulers were in great difficulty because the walls were going badly in France, the crisis was getting worse, they needed more money to maintain their standard of living. And in December 1380, John of Gaunt took his parliament to Northampton. You know, you go, oh, do we have parliament today? What is parliament? Four blokes? Uh, let's go to Northampton, nice place around there, we can stay in one of my 14 houses and so on and so forth. Took his parliament to Northampton, where they decided that they were going to have a poll tax, which is a sort of that except that you don't have to buy anything to pay it, you just pay the tax. <laughs> every person, every member of the population over the age of 14 uh, had to pay at least a shilling, that is at least a monthly wage. Every person, for every person over the age of 14. 
And the problem with a poll tax, which they knew right away was, how to collect it. Because if they were to collect it by the procedure which had gone up to them, they weren't going to get it. And that was because people had understood how to escape from one village to the other, how to get off the roll on this village and off it on that, how to dodge the bailiffs when they came. Many of the bailiffs were dissatisfied themselves about the taxes that they had to collect. And so, while they put the, in the December 1380, put the tax and also set up a new set of tax collectors, a new pe- group of people under a particularly revolting specimen, even within, even within the, con- in, in the context of the revolting specimens who appointed him, John Legg was conceivably the nastiest person in the whole of this very nasty story. John Legg, just the man to put in charge, uh, he was a sort of mixture of the black and tans and the racist immigration officer at London Airport. That was the sort of person that he was. And those were the sort of people that he collected around him to engage in these uh, poll taxes. Why I mentioned the immigration officers at London Airport is simply this, that one of the things that they had to do and one of the things that caused the greatest resentment among the people was to discover whether people were 14 or not, whether they were over 14 or not, were they 15 or not. And John Legg devised what he called the puberty test, which has its echo, doesn't it, coming through to the virginity test. Let us discover, have they arrived at puberty? And they would measure the pubic hairs of the children into the houses that they went to in order to discover simply by rote whether or not they should pay the tax. That, as you can imagine, was not particularly popular. And through January, February and March, they brought up their forces, collected their forces, a new drilled gang of tax collectors was collected, and they started in April, and as though to mark the date, on April the 26th, John Ball was arrested and imprisoned in Maidstone Prison. The real counter-offensive, what the gang were really going to do to crack down once and for all on this, uh, all this uh, insubordination over the last 30 years had started. But instead, instead of that happening, of course, it was the spark to the flame. And don't forget, it's not just a spark to a flame like peasants' revolt in other parts of Europe at that time. It's spark to a flame over fuel and tinder which has been piled up, carefully piled up and carefully arranged over a whole number of years. Now on May the 30th, a man called Thomas Banton, a very, very important man indeed, rode into Brentwood at the group at the head of a group of five or six armed people to complain about the low taxation of the Essex village of Fobbing. People from Essex here have never heard of Fobbing. Fobbing doesn't exist any longer. At any rate, he said that the people have done it good. He said that the people of Fobbing are very glad. And uh, if anyone from Brentwood here, as you fight your... I've been to Brentwood a couple of times. As you fight your way through the estate agents and the banks of the main street, just keep yourself going on a fact that the Peasants' Revolt started in Brentwood. Now then, Thomas Dunton comes into Brentwood and uh, asks about this low and the men of Fobbing say they pay the taxes and they don't intend to pay any more and so of course he orders their arrest. I mean, standard reaction. And then something fantastic happened. The Fobbing men refused to be arrested. And then something more fantastic happened. A hundred men with long bones were standing outside the court, just like that. <laughs> And they politely asked Mr. Bampton if he would mind getting on his horse and going out of Brentwood, which he did with amazing rapidity. (laughs) And he went to see the authorities. He went to see a man called Sir Robert Belknap. See, Thomas Banton was a very important person, but Sir Robert Belknap, he was the Chief Justice of the Common Pleas. I cannot describe to you how important he was. (laughs) He came to Brentwood with 15 men. 15, that's a lot, you know. You don't need 15 men to carry out a puberty test on a 15-year-old child. He came to Brentwood and commanded a jury to charge the rebels. These men have revolted against the crown, let's have a jury. Well, two people in Brentwood agreed to form a jury. That was enough for Sir Robert. Two good men and true. (laughs) Two angry men, whichever way you want to look at it. 
and he'd started the court and then there were 500 men outside the court with long bows and they took hold of Sir Robert Belknap and they put him the wrong way round on his horse and tied him to it <laughs> and sent him out of the town and he'd gone a long way before someone got him down and then he saw another horse coming towards him and on the horse were the two heads of the jurors who had agreed to stand uh, to, in, to indict the rebels of, uh, 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 of Brentwood. Now on the same day on the same day you see people say you know the thing wasn't planned out, a sporadic outburst on the same day June the 2nd in Dartford in Kent which is some way away one of John Legg's gangs went to the house of John Tyler and it's better now I read it out directly because uh, people never believe me you know Some of Legg's fellow criminals, this is a, actually quite a, a, a moderate uh, historian, it's not a, a socialist at all, a man called Morris, a liberal, he, he refers to Legg's fellow criminals, so you can see what even, uh, even sort of quite ordinary people think about this. <laughs> uh, <coughs> Some of Legg's fellow criminals had already arrived and had gone to the house of one John Tyler and demanded of his wife the payment of the poll tax on behalf of herself, her husband and her daughter. She refused to pay for her daughter as not being of age and the collector thereupon seized the daughter declaring he would discover if this were true neighbours came running in and John Tyler being at work in the same town tiling of a house when he heard thereof caught his lathing staff in his hand and ran reeking home don't know what reeking means <laughs> where reasoning with the collector who made him so bold the collector answered with stout words and straight at the tiler whereupon the tiler avoiding the blow smote the collector with the lathing staff that the brains flew out of his head where <laughs> through great noise arose in the streets and the poor people being glad everyone prepared to support the said John Tyler told you you wouldn't believe it but that's the original chronicler not the modern historian that's the original chronicler and uh, uh, that in Kent just as the incident in Brentwood had been the spark that was the spark in Kent and great troops of armed peasants suddenly started arriving at the main townships of Essex and Kent within a matter of 24 hours on June the 3rd the monastery at Erith had fallen on June the 5th the castle at Rochester never before fallen to a foreign foe since the Norman conquest fell to the peasants on June the 6th John Ball was set free out of Maidstone prison and it was there as he was set free that rebel forces coming representing 20, 30, 40,000 men coming there to Maidstone uh, were, were, uh, 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 elected as their leader a man called Watt Tyler not the John Tyler that was there but another man called Watt Tyler about whom to his enormous credit we know absolutely nothing we don't know what he looked like we don't know what he did for a living we don't know anything and so I'll just take one of the historians that writes about this time because I know there are lots of academic people here that like to have sensible university uh, 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 people, professors and so on to tell them the truth about what, what Tyler was and here is Professor Sir Charles Oman you couldn't get better than that could you <laughs> The Great Revolt, Oxford University Press 1906 It is probable that Tyler was an adventurer of unknown antecedents <laughs> uh, how, how, how are your antecedents today? Are they... <laughs> Are they unknown? <laughs> and we may well believe the Kentishman who declared that he was a well-known rogue and highwayman. <laughs> we may well believe. That's the way professors write, you see. That's the way they come directly to the question. People who've really done the research. We may well believe a Kentishman who declared that he was a well-known rogue and highwayman. Oh, well. Rogue and highwayman will do for us because he was leading Wat Tyler an army of 70,000 people through Kent and at the same time Jack Straw was leading another army of 70,000 people through Essex and the army every day growing and then through Hertfordshire and Buckinghamshire, Bedfordshire, Suffolk, Cambridgeshire, Norfolk, even Lincolnshire for heaven's sake there were peasants 
meeting together in the villages as though indeed because of prearranged plan through representatives who pre previously had been appointed and marked down. Because when John Ball was released from prison at Maidstone, he wrote his famous letters. Only two or three have come down to us. But the letters are direct. The letters are like Socialist Worker Party circulars. They are to Jack so-and-so. Get out there and get the people out. You there, go for this particular landlord. You there, go for that particular set of manorial roles, sections of the manorial roles, they didn't sack the monasteries, they didn't even burn them down, they didn't even burn down many of the great houses in their locality, but what they went for directly as though by prearranged plan, indeed by prearranged plan, they went for the roles which existed inside the manors and inside the townships and inside the monasteries which listed the previous crimes that people had, had committed, that listed the, 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 their liability for tax, they listed what tax they'd been paid. Those were the things that were particularly hated. And those throughout all those counties were destroyed in monastery after monastery. And then on June the 11th, again synchronized, these two of the, the two big armies, the army from Kent and the army from Essex, incidentally representing two rather different forms of exploitation, men of Kent much more... Uh, advanced if you like but the men of Essex much more exploited and therefore more ferocious coming there to meet uh, outside London Tyler's army at Blackheath and Straws at Barnet really surrounding London and you can imagine then the feelings that were going on inside the Tower of London the only decision that was taken as a matter of fact by the King's Council was to shut the gates of the Tower of London and the feelings that were going on 70,000 men at Blackheath and there's probably another 70,000 at Barnet, and the situation is really rather serious for us, because Sir David McNee is not here, we don't have any police, we don't have any riot shields, we don't know what we're going to do about this situation, the people are in motion, we can't even trust the people of London, we can't trust the people of London uh, not to join these uh, vagabonds. And therefore, really, literally, all these people, most of them, as it turned out, quite properly, were worried for their lives. And their only hope that they had was this faith that the people had in their king. This thing that went to the root of the demands of the peasants during this pro uh, process. For King Richard and the true commons, King Richard who was a boy of 14, that was their slogan because they believed that the king, and it's a strange thing that you hear the echo today, the king himself, there was nothing wrong with that, it was the courtiers, the hangers-on, the family, the John of Dawn, the Princess Margaret. It was the people around the king that were the people that were, the, 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 that were particularly detestable. But the king himself came from God, and the king could do no wrong. And the king believed in the people over whom he ruled, and had an indissoluble link with the people over whom he, whom he ruled, and the king would see them straight. And just as the rebels had no idea of the danger of that view, the king's council realized that it was their only possible opportunity. And they made a desperate attempt to stop the armies going into London. And the king and his closest advisers took a barge and they went down to Rotherhithe, Bermondsey Way, in the royal barge and called upon Wat Tyler and the people to come and meet them there to have a discussion about what they wanted. And again, I shall have to read this because you won't believe me. From the Chronicles. Accordingly, attended by the earls, very important to remember the names, I hope you'll all remember the names, particularly those of you who come from these places, attended by the earls of Salisbury, Warwick and Suffolk. Fantastic! Yes, three earls in one boat. And other knights, Richard rode down the Thames towards Rotherhithe. That doesn't, of course, mean that he rode, you understand. <laughs> Any dispute about it. He was rode down the Thames towards Rotherhithe. Uh, where were upwards of 10,000 men who had come from Blackheath to see the king and to speak with him. When the king, and this is from the Chronicle, when the king and his lord saw this crowd of people and the wildness of their manner, there was not one among them so bold and determined, but felt alarmed. The king was advised by his barons not to land, but to have his barge rowed up and down the river. What do you wish for? demanded the king. I am come hither to hear what ye have come to say. Those near him cried out with one voice, we wish thee to land when we will remonstrate with thee and tell thee more at our ease what our wants are. The Earl of Salisbury then replied to the king, 
The Earl of Salisbury then replied to the King and said, Gentlemen, you are not uh, properly dressed. <laughs> Nor in a fit condition for the King to talk with you. Nothing more was said, <laughs> for the King was desired to return to the Tower of London from whence he had set out. And the Earls and Marquesses of Salisbury have been saying it for 600 years. You're improperly dressed all through that period and nothing happened. That particular event meant absolutely nothing. And uh, naturally enough, the rebels did move into the city of London from both sides. And once again, they acted swiftly and with great restraint as though by prearranged plan. They went for two areas alone. Two areas are particularly hated. They went for the temple representing all the lawyers, all the lawyers lived in the temple, still do for a matter of fact, and they burnt it all down. They've <laughs> rebuilt it since. And then they went to the Savoy, uh, which was the palace of John of Gaul, and they burnt that down with the most systematic savagery. Every single thing in it was burnt and burnt and burnt again, and only one person died in the whole of that operation and that was a looter who was seen something ta taking something out of a Savoy which wouldn't be burnt and they were so angry that anything connected with John of Gaunt should not be burnt they killed the looter and burnt the thing that he'd taken out of it. That was the position uh, on June the 13th. And on June the 14th the king admitted defeat and he opened the gates of the Tower of London and he went to Mile End to meet Tyler's army and agreed to all the rebels' demands, agreed to all of them Repeal of the statute of labourers and all the repressive statutes of the last 30 years. An end to bondage and villainage. Worst of all for the landed gentry, all game and fish to be open to the commons and all the common land which had previously been taken by the monasteries to be returned to the commons. And it wasn't just a word, it wasn't just his word. He sat all day at Mile End in his tent signing charters, the people from this village, from that village, all over Kent in particular, the charters were signed there by the king and handed to the people that they would have freedom from all these uh, 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 oppressions which they've been fighting against over such a long period. And meantime, in the city, with the gates of the Tower of London open, the rebel army moved on the tower, no looting, no destruction, no burning of the tower, they knew what they wanted, and they got them. They got the Archbishop Sudbury, they got Hales, they got the detested leg, they got lions, all of them lost their head and the, uh, heads and the gang, but for the king, and for John of Gaunt, of course, who was fighting one of his pet wars up in Scotland, uh, had gone forever. But of course, there was another gang to replace that gang, and that gang uh, realized the central weakness of the peasant armies, that they could not last forever. They were unlikely to go on forever, they couldn't be supplied, they were forced to disband and return to their fields. And above all, that they trusted the king. And so after waiting a week in which Gradually they built up their own forces, the forces loyal to the barons and the manors around the London area and collected them into London. They set up a new and this time very successful intrigue. I don't want to go into the story because I'm sure if there's any part of the story that any of you know, it'll be this part. But they went to Smithfield, the great meat market, what's now the great meat market, then starting to be a meat market even then. And a huge area, over a huge area, placing the army of Wat Tyler some mile away. They insisted that Tyler come alone and talk to the king's men further negotiations about his demands and whether the army would disband. And Tyler, of course, trusting the king, agreed to that. And he came alone on his horse and engaged in sort of absurd negotiations for a few moments. It's not exactly known what happened. Somebody, somebody shouted out some insulting remark. Tyler is said to have drawn his dagger. Five people had jumped to him, stabbed him, and he lay there uh, dying on the, uh, on the floor, on the ground. And then the king, alone, went up to the army that was all that distance away and explained to them that there had been an accident, that uh, a mistake. Not to be clear what he said to them, but whatever he said to them, what is clear is that he managed to lead that army away, promising them 
that their demands would be met in full and had been met in full and it was a terrible thing that their leader had been killed and he led them out of the city and really by leading them out of the city that moment sees the, the climax of the revolt it begins to fall away from there it's, uh, 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 it's really the beginning of the end because the confidence the confidence of those armies depended on ongoing success the success continuing and now the success has stopped and some people were confused and ill at ease and it's difficult even to imagine in those circumstances how they could have done what they did unless one recognizes the tremendous power which the royal presence had at that time over the, uh, 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 over the common people and of course in the space that was left the king and the nobles marshaled their armies in a new spirit of confidence for them and went to smash the pockets of insurgents as they were about the country and I never like to deal too long in the period of, that follows a, 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 a rebellion in if you like the counter-revolutionary period or not, not quite describe this but things happened which are only too familiar every home in London was visited by the forces of the king and asked to swear an oath of allegiance on pain of death with varying degrees of resistance the peasant forces were broken John Ball was half hanged disemboweled while still alive, hanged again and drawn at St. Albans, John Raw, Jack Straw, John Searle in Sussex, William Grime Cobb in St. Albans, all of them were executed in one way or another after varying forms of resistance in different times. And if there's anybody from St. Albans here, I don't want to go into the story at great length, but if there's anybody from St. Albans here, you don't have to apologize any longer even for that. You don't even have to apologize. All you have to say when somebody says you come from St. Albans, yes, well, in spite of that, William Grimecobb came from St. Albans. And William Grimecobb was arrested, imprisoned, and told that he would be killed unless he went back and told the insurgents to lay down their arms. And he agreed to go back and spoke to his army of some 100, 150 men in St. Albans and told them on no account whether to lay, to lay down their arms but they were to continue the struggle and he was taken from behind while he was speaking and executed and that's the sort of man that represents the spirit of the peasants' revolt. In Billericay, 500 were put to death by a particularly revolting specimen who tried to, uh, who ran a, a competition for how many people could be hanged on a branch of one tree and the, the uh, the, uh, the record was 19 and the proportions of the deaths in this business are familiar for all the revolutions that we talk about all the revolts and rebellions and risings in the rising itself perhaps a hundred dead most of them people guilty of the most terrible extortion and exploitation over a long period of time and in the putting down of the rising perhaps 3,000 dead that's roughly the proportions that have been followed in similar events all the way through history and when the men of Essex, finally beaten and broken down by this force of arms, sent or got through three messengers that got through to the court with the charter that the king had signed at uh, Mile End, saying, look, you say in your charter you're going to deal away with bondage and villainage, but our Lord is demanding us back and forcing us back into that condition. The reply of this boy king, this uh, hero of the hour, is really what sums him up better than anything you'll ever read in Shakespeare or anywhere else. Serfs you have been and serfs you shall remain in bondage. Not such as you have hitherto been subjected to, but incomparably viler. For so long as we live and rule by God's grace over this kingdom, we shall use our strength, sense and property to treat you that your slavery may be an example to posterity and that those who live now and hereafter who may be like you, may always have before their eyes, as it were in a glass, your misery and reasons for cursing you and the fear of doing things like those which you have done. That's the real spokesman of class war in victory, groveling at Mile End, signing the charters, and only really eight or nine days later giving voice to his terrible contempt and hatred which had arisen from being beaten. But the truth of the matter is, and it is not the case, as historians always tell you, that revolts such as the Peasants' Revolt of 1381 left the peasants worse off than they were before. It isn't the case that the rising would better not have happened. For rural Richard, Richard as he spoke those words was whistling in the dark and he knew he was whistling in the dark. 
because he and his nobles had seen the strength and the power of the risen people the potential of the risen people and he wasn't going to risk that in any circumstances again and in 1382 a new poll tax was ordered by Gaunt's parliament but this time for landowners only and in 1390 the attempt to hold down wages by law was formally abandoned and the statute of labourers effectively appealed, repealed and in 50 years, only 50 years from the uh, end of the Peasants' Revolt, effectively, bondage and villainage was wiped off the face of the map in England before anywhere else in Europe. And when you ask the question, try to ask the question, as I'm inclined to do from time to time, why was England first in the fight against feudalism? Why was it first in England in the 1640s that the final revolution and the crashing of feudalism took place? best answer, one of the best answers that you'll get is precisely in the success of the Peasants' Revolt. More successful than all those revolts in Europe like the Jacquerie in France, for instance. More successful than any of those precisely because it was organized. This is the conclusion of Reg Groves and Philip Lindsay's uh, marvelous book on this subject. Reg Groves will be well known to readers of Socialist Worker and uh, Socialist Review and other publications very fine writer, and that's by far the best book, by the way, about the Peasants' Revolt. All that we know about the commoners of the 14th century England suggests that they had long awaited and prepared for extensive and radical revolution. That's the most important thing about it. The organization, the propaganda, the linking of the organization of propaganda, the appointment of representatives, the linking from the town to the country to the town to the different county to county, all those things which were so hostile to everything connected with feudalism were done in that time and they were able to raise armies which were scared the living daylights out of the rulers of the time such as none of the other revolts in Europe did at that time. And after all, it wasn't a bad bag for nine days, was it? The Archbishop of Canterbury, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, the Chief Prison Officer of the country, Tresillian of Southwark, who was taken as they moved through the south of London, the Lord Chief Justice Cavendish, head of a long line, the Duke of Devonshire, he was done down in burying his head on the top there, the Chief Tax Collector, Leg, the Chief Monopolist, Lyons, well, I think a Cromwell or a Robespierre would have been quite proud of that in nine days, that's the truth of the matter. They did scare them. And the scaring goes on now in the ruler's mind, even today, even the, with a the miserable little bit of history that the ruling class gets, they're scared by what happened at that time. It just occurs to me, it's possible, that there are people here who have not read A Bleak House by Charles Dickens, conceivable. You don't have to admit to it now. <laughs> put, it, <laughs> put it right, you know, and next time you go on holiday, if you're dissatisfied, I'll refund you the cost of the book. To have to prove to me that you bought it. <laughs> Bleak House uh, has a wonderful character in it called Celeste Deadlock. You know, the names actually uh, of Dickens always sum the person up. Celeste Deadlock, well, I don't have to tell you what sort of a person there was. He was always worried about the floodgates. You know, the floodgates. Flood, they have this, what was it, that quote from Gower? Things are irresistible, water and the masses. Uh, and therefore they talk like that. The floodgates are open, the sluice gates are open, society as we know it is in peril. Now this is a story about a case in the Court of Chancery. Let's read you a little bit. There are a number of examples of this, but who's he? He, Celesta, regards the Court of Chancery, even if it should involve an occasional delay of justice and a trifling amount of confusion, as a, as a something divine in conjunction with a variety of other somethings, by the perfection of human wisdom for the eternal settlement of everything. And he is upon the whole of a fixed opinion that to give the sanction of his countenance to any complaints respecting the court of chancery would be to encourage some person in the lower classes to rise up somewhere, like Watts Tyler. And if you go through the whole of this book and all the references to Celeste Dedlock, when someone says something wrong at a party or eats with the wrong knife or doesn't come home at the time that they ought to, Celeste is reminded of someone he's never heard of in any context whatever of Watt Tyler and people who meet by torchlight 
with grim and swarthy expressions and will come to take his property which he knows he has taken from them. They're frightened of it and it lingers on in their memory and I think it should linger on in ours as well. Now in 1903 Martov wrote to Lenin about a dispute in the Bolshevik party and the letter started we are not peasants. It establishes a tendency among people who think about history, Marxists who think about history, or people who call themselves Marxists, Marxist thinkers of history, to see history as something that's divided up, that the peasant is something of a different age, separate from us, nothing to do with us, that history moves by stages, scientifically stages, and the stages are marked out by history and it's nothing therefore to do with us what happened 600 years ago in a quite different sort of economy, nothing to do, we can leave it on one side, we're not peasants, we're very advanced people, we've been in the industrial working class burrowing there for years and got pretty well nowhere and we're terribly important and we're really much more important than anyone uh, uh, in, that, uh, in that sort of uh, uh, field at all. And I think that that, that, that is not only reactionary and wrong and paralyzing because all that idea that history determines things and that everything's inevitable paralyzes us, leaves out the activity which is at the center uh, of the, uh, uh, of the, of the, of the pe peasants' result, revolt, but also insulting to the people who carried those standards for us all through those years before, insulting to them. The truth is that it is the thing that's most extraordinary about reading and learning about the Peasants' Revolt is not the difference, not the differences between us and them. I mean, I suppose subconsciously one knew that there were those differences there and it's not therefore the differences between us and them that shine out, it's the similarities and the similarities which were bound together by the fact that there is this relentless struggle between the classes going on all the way through their story and all the way through ours. The relentless battle between the possessed and the dispossessed. The people who've got the property and the people who haven't got the property and what you do about it and how you fight against it. And if you like the old Shelley quote, the spirit that lifts the slave before his lord is the spirit of the peasant's revolt and that's the thing that rolls down on us through the ages. Now, in, uh, in 1881, 100 years ago, inspired by the celebrations of the 500th anniversary of the Peasants' Revolt, William Morris, a very great socialist writer, sat down to grapple with this problem. Here we do have something in connection with what John Ball and what Tyler were doing in 1381. And how could he, with his enormous writing powers, try to bridge the gap for the socialists for whom he was writing? He set out in a really very brilliant piece of writing. It took him a long time to do it and didn't in fact appear until 1885. But he set out in a very brilliant piece of writing to try and bridge that gap, to pull the two together. And the way he did it was this. He devised, imagined himself, or somebody like himself, a socialist in 1881, being plunged back in the sort of Doctor Who uh, circumstances into the villages of Kent in, uh, in, um, in, in 1381 and going through the processes of beating off the king's men and beating off the barons and the nobles through battles there very well described he describes John Ball coming to the village probably the best description there is probably better than the chronicles themselves because he really went into it and found out how to do it and then at the end of the piece it's called The Dream of John Ball at the end of the piece this man who has all this experience of 500 years after 1381 has a long discussion with John Ball about what will happen. John Ball says, well, I can see that you know what's going to happen. And we all know the revolt's going to fail, but what's going to happen after that? What about my dream? What about the dream that I have, this heavenly thing that I have, of all people living in common and sharing everything and not being any vassals or lords? When's that going to come? He says, in, I'm afraid, in all my information, I've got all this information, 500 years of information, and I'm afraid it hasn't come yet. Awfully sorry, 500 years. So not surprisingly, John Ball gets a bit depressed about that. He says, here we're going off tomorrow, I'm probably going to be disemboweled and all that sort of thing. And you're telling me that in 500 years, nothing will have been achieved. Is it worth a disemboweling? Shouldn't I go now to uh, uh, try and become the next Archbishop of Canterbury in order to get out of these circumstances? And uh, the reply that he gets to that uh, expression of depression uh, comes from Morris or from the Socialist today, loud and clear. John Ball, 
be of good cheer, for once more thou knowest, as I know, that the fellowship of man shall endure, however many tribulations it may have to wear through. It may well be that this bright day of summer, which is now dawning upon us, is no image of the beginning of the day that shall be, but rather shall that day dawn be cold and grey and surly. And yet, by its light, shall men see things as they verily are, and no longer enchanted by the gleam of the moon and the glamour of the dream tide. By such grey light shall wise men and valiant souls see the remedy and deal with it, a real thing that may be touched and handled, and no glory of the heavens to be worshipped from afar off. And what shall it be, as I told thee before, save that men shall be determined to be free, yea, free as thou wouldst have them, when thine hope rises the highest, and thou art thinking not of the king's uncles and pole grope bailiffs and the village of Essex, but at the end of it all, when men shall have the fruits of the earth, and the fruits of their toil thereon, without money and without price. That time shall come, John Ball, when that dream of thine shall this one day be, shall be a thing that man shall talk of soberly and as a thing soon to come about as even with thee they talk of the villains becoming tenants paying their lord quit rent therefore hast thou done well to hope it and thy name shall abide by thy hope in those days to come and thou shalt not be forgotten